We're here in Las Vegas with Sony's newest full-frame camera, the a7 III, a snack-sized A9. I'll have what he's having. All right, we're out here in the desert testing the Sony a7 III. Let's run through the specs. What are we gonna be looking at over the next couple of days of shooting with this camera? It's got a 24 megapixel sensor in here and it is a completely redesigned backside illuminated sensor. And along with that, it can do 10 frames per second. That's mechanical shutter or the completely silent electronic shutter. And that is a full 14 bit raw all the way up to 10 frames per second. And we have an autofocus system that borrows heavily from the A9. That's their flagship sports and action oriented camera. 693 autofocus points in here. And you've got tracking, of course, and that really lovely IAF system that we saw in the A9. It's also in the 7R Mark III, and I really like how well it works. It's supposed to be even a little bit better in this camera. And on top of that, we've got 4K, you can do HDR, S-Log2, S-Log3, and one of the things that I love the most probably is the redesigned body. The user interface seems much more user-friendly. We've got the joystick, we've got a touch screen for selecting focus points, dual card slots, and this is huge, literally, the redesigned battery. It's so much larger. This camera is rated at 710 shots per charge. That's the highest of any mirrorless camera to date. I'm anxious to see exactly how that performs and translates into real world use. Let's get tested in this camera. All right, so in this test, we are looking at the performance of the higher ISOs. The a7 III goes up to a whopping 204,800 when you get into that extended range. Well, I'm comparing it to the a7R3 and the most recent full-frame competitor on the market, the 6D Mark II. Both of these cameras top out at 102,400. We're using the 24-70 f2.8 Canon lens across all of these to maintain consistency, and let's take a look at these results. All right, so we've had some time to sit down and shoot some sample comparisons really looking at the higher ISO capabilities of the a7 III. And I have to say, they're pretty good. Usable, right on up to 25,600. What we're looking at is JPEG straight out of the camera. We turned all of the noise reduction off. And I think they're usable, 25,600. You maybe even could convince me that they're usable up at 51,000 if you're just gonna put it on Instagram. Uh, not too bad. We've made some comparisons. We're looking at the a7R versus the a7 III, and they're very similar on up through that range. But when you downsize those R3 images, they do look better at those higher ISOs. But you have to pixel peep and look really closely to see these differences. We also looked at comparing it against the 6D Mark II, and I have to say the Canon holds in there pretty well, up to about 12,800 where the Sonys really start to pull away, and I would happily shoot with a Canon above 12,000, but I was pleased with where it ended up. You know, overall, this camera's doing really well, and I just think it's pretty amazing that we're talking about an entry full-frame camera capable of shooting at 51,000 and getting usable prints out of them. We're gonna pack up, and we're gonna go off and shoot some more models and really put that IAF to the test. With most of these models, I'm able to shoot them using that IAF. It just makes it really easy. Now, every occasionally, shooting shots where their eyes aren't visible. Because we've got the A9 styling and the A7R3 style with the focus point joystick, it makes it really easy to move it around and nail that focus spot that you want.
One of the other things that has plagued the Sony cameras in the past is kind of the anemic buffer. I mean, it just fills up really quickly. They seem to solve that with the a7R 3 and well, they've solved it with the a7 III as well. I'm shooting long bursts of these dancers moving through this water and while you can see the buffer is writing and you are locked out of some of the menu options, I haven't filled that buffer and lost any frames or lost any moments being captured yet. One of the things that you all asked about is focus in low light. It's critically important if this is a camera that you want to walk in and cover a wedding, especially the reception or dance floor. We've got these bright studios around us, but in the kind of waiting area here, we've got this low blue light. And so I've just been shooting other celebrities like myself. And uh, the focus is good. The IAF certainly struggles in lower light if it can't clearly see an eye but medium spot, move it around with a joystick, it seems to lock on very quickly, or you go to the one of the more automated modes, which I don't love, but also seems to grab focus quickly in this low light. All right, so many of you have asked, the Sony a7 III does not have apps like previous model. It's continuing this kind of new trend. We saw it in the R3, we see it in the a9. So no time-lapse app, no reflection app. I wanna do a time-lapse of these guys working in the kitchen here. So I've got the MyOps mobile up on top. That triggers it. Obviously, I need to then post-process all of this into a video so it doesn't do it in camera. Another option would be to use S and Q on the dial. You can go down to one frame a second, which is a time lapse in most cases. All right, so we're finishing up a fantastic meal here at Sparrow and Wolf, and uh, I set up a time lapse recording what's happening in the kitchen as they were plating all of the food dishes, bringing them out to us. Not only because I thought it might interest, create some interesting B-roll, but also I wanted to just push that battery. Shot about 2,000 photos today. A lot of time playing with the menus, digging in Wi-Fi, transferring pictures. That left me about 20% when I set up for the time lapse. Looks like I got about another 2,000 photos from the time lapse over a course of almost two hours, and that took me to a completely dead battery. So I'm pretty impressed with over 4,000 photos today on a single battery. All right, we come out to Nella Sand Dunes. We've got some dune buggy action. This is a great testing ground for the 10 frames per second, which we've used a bunch already on this trip, but how does that AF system back up that 10 frames a second? How many shots are actually in focus when you're shooting at that higher burst rate? Let's capture some of these guys in action. All right, so he's going pretty fast. I've got lock on tracking turned on AFC, 10 frames per second. Most of them are in focus. I'm certainly seeing some of them a little bit out of focus. I wanna play with these focus modes a little bit more, see if we can get a little bit of a higher consistency and even more shots in focus. Hi everybody, I'm Kazuo Maeda. I'm the videographer and editor for a lot of Topi's videos. I follow them around, we come to events like this, and I'll help him create the videos. So when we were both invited to come check out the a7 III, I was really excited to see the video features that they were able to pack into this camera. So starting off, you get 1080p at 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, or even 120 frames per second, so that you get some slow-mo options, really cool, up to 100 megabits per second. And for the first time in the regular A7 line, 
The a7 III also has 4K recording, 30 frames per second or the more cinema style 24 frames per second. Now this does shoot internal at 8-bit 420. Also in this camera you get a lot of different picture profiles, the standard cinema styles, vivid and just plain neutral, but you also get access to S-Log 2 and 3, which kind of flatten the video profile allowing you to have more dynamic range, capture some of those highlights. If you use those a lot you'll, you'll find that it adds a lot of workflow at the end, you have to do a lot of coloring, a lot of stretching just to make it look good. And if you don't expose properly, you can get some blocking in the darks, which we actually got in a couple of clips that I shot with Toby here. You also have two other picture profiles that use the HLG um, color gamut. They work really, really well. Same kind of thing. It's going to tack more on your end workflow if you want to use them. So these picture profiles, I'd use them sparingly. Generally, I'll just shoot in kind of a flatter cinema style and then just stretch it out a little bit in post versus uh, using the S-Log or the S-Log 3 for the whole production because then my editing time basically doubles. So when it comes to the tools in this camera, you also have lots of powerful things. You have focus peaking, you have focus magnification. You also have access to the touchscreen, which is really nice for the one autofocus mode that they have. There's no single autofocus here. You can't just say autofocus here and then stop. It only has continuous autofocus. So you have to kind of manage that. So you can use the back touchscreen to say, hey, focus here, now focus here. Really good for rack focusing, really good for following moving subjects. I wouldn't suggest using the focus nub though, because when you start using this, you start shaking your camera as you're trying to adjust the focus point. I strongly suggest using the continuous autofocus. It's really nice, but then assigning one of your quick buttons to turning the manual focus back on. So when you do lock on to your subject, you can turn that off to prevent the camera from hunting. We also have the Super 35 and full frame readouts for this camera. Those both work in 4K and in 1080p. Now, the great thing about this guy, unlike some of the older models, you have really no picture degradation when switching between Super 35 or full frame. In some of the previous models, Super 35 was the better choice, but in this one, I can, I can safely say that they're both pretty much equally sharp. Uh, so there's really no reason you should use one over the other, which basically means you double your lens selection. If you have a 28 wide, that also is a 42 relative normal in Super 35. You have a 50, you also have a 75 as well. Super awesome, definitely use that to get in closer if you need to, or go a little bit wider if you have to. There isn't a crop when you are shooting full frame, except for one, one very specific type of shooting, and that's when you're shooting 4K at 30 frames per second, they do tack on a 1.2 crop on the image. We were talking to some of the Sony techs here. It's because at 30 frames per second at 4K is just too much data readout, so they, they had to reduce the size. But shoot at 24 frames per second at 4K, you do get the full frame 35 millimeter readout. No changes at the Super 35. ISO performance, it's pretty good. All the way up to 6400, I would say, is completely usable. Once you get past that 12,800, you can use that in a pinch, and above that, it really starts to fall apart. But if you do shoot in 4K and you do downsize it to 1080p, you do reduce a lot of that noise, so you can probably get away with shooting a little bit higher at 4K if you plan on outputting at 1080p. Next up, this is really important to me, is proxy support. So these guys can also shoot low resolution proxies. So if you're editing on the go on a laptop or if you just don't have a very high-end computer, you can shoot 4K footage with this and record low resolution proxies, which you can then edit in your NLE editing system like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut. And then when you go to export the final media, swap in the original 4K files so you get that really high resolution video in the end. Now back in the day on the A7R2, you would have about a five frame lag difference between the proxies and the full resolution video, which means if you have some really tight audio splices, those would get mistimed in the export and you'd have to go through, find those and correct them because everything would shift five frames. And so your perfect little cut shifts. Now here, the lag has been reduced. Last but not least, rolling shutter. Don't really see too much rolling shutter in here. And if you're using a lot of pans that you get a lot of rolling shutter, probably gonna make your audience sick before you'll notice the rolling shutter. So that's all I have to say about the video. Wonderful camera for 2000 bucks for an entry level full frame, totally worth it. All right, it's clear after a couple of days of shooting with the new Sony a7 III that Sony really wants to dominate this camera space, even if it might mean cannibalizing 
some of their own cameras. We're not going to run through the whole spec list, but it is clear to me that this camera lives up to that kind of excitement and hype that many of us had when we first saw the list. It is a fantastic 24 megapixel sensor in here. The fact that this entry level full frame camera, which typically in the past has kind of been slower, more cumbersome beasts, can do 10 frames per second with an autofocus system that is very good, I would feel comfortable walking into any kind of professional shoot with this camera. And I think that says a lot. You add on that we've got the new ergonomic design. It, it feels better in the hand. It is much friendlier to use. In the past, when I've recommended Sony's to people, I have to caution them and say, it's, I love the output of the camera. I love what I get from it, but they're not much fun to use. They, you have to really work at it. They're a little frustrating. And this new ergonomics with the touch screen, the focus point joystick, they really help and make this feel like a full featured serious camera. Then you tack on the fact that we've got the new battery in here. 710 shots is what it's rated at. I mentioned to you all the other day that I got over 4,000 on a single battery. That's fantastic. Along with 4K, HDR, S-Log features, if you're a serious videographer, this camera can do it for you. Is this a bite-sized or a snack-sized A9? I think there's enough differentiation there. I mean, the A9, 20 frames per second, completely silently if you want with no worry about rolling shutter or people being warped in the shot from rolling shutter. This camera is typical of the other A7 series in that you do have to worry about rolling shutter when you're shooting silently, but it is still the 14-bit RAW, which is nice. So that's an easy thing to distinguish. It gets harder when we're now talking about the A7R3 or the A7 III. 42 megapixels plus the pixel shift feature is really all that $1,200 gets you extra over the A7 III right now. And 42 megapixels might sound like a lot more than 24, but I'm really impressed with how well the detail of these files in the A7 III hold up. So there may be some of you out there that say, I want 42 megapixels, I want that pixel shift, which really is a useful feature in some situations. Then you're gonna spend the extra 1200. For many of us, I think this A7 III is an absolutely fantastic camera and gives you more than you need and you'll be very happy with it and you can put those savings towards a new lens or two. I've got a whole kind of kit put together of what I recommend with the Sony a7 III. That's linked right down below along with other links to purchase these products. Your use of those links greatly helps out what we do here at Photorec.tv. And of course, if you found this video useful, give it a quick thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more future gear reviews, tips, tricks, and travel videos. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.